Hey class, uh, I want to begin by announcing a couple things. First, uh, I've extended homework 2 to be due next Thursday instead of this Thursday, so if you've already completed it, uh, all the better, then you don't have to worry about uh, anything this week. Uh, and then second, uh, I need to, uh, to again uh, affirm that I have been uh, wrong. Uh, I've introduced uh, an improper argument. Uh, and I want to highlight that. And if you're done with Fermat, then avert your eyes for the next minute or whatever. It should be pretty quick. Um, but uh, I, I just, uh, if I know that I'm wrong, I, I definitely want to inform you uh, so that you don't go forward, <laughs> uh, you know, using these, these improper lessons that I've taught you. Uh, and then we'll resume with uh, discrete probability. Uh, okay, so the argument uh, was, uh, I, I used, I believe a similar argument for both the real parts and uh, the other one. But um, anyway, the, the argument for whenever n was even uh, was essentially that uh, one of these two terms had to be irrational. Uh, but that result was concluded from, uh, I believe, this ratio uh, in which there is no counterbalancing 2, uh, which becomes an n root of 2. Uh, and uh, See, so uh, we inferred that if we're to promote n from this relationship, uh, that this 2 has to necessarily balance some uh, n root of 2 in the denominator. Uh, and since the 2 doesn't appear over here, that is necessarily rational. Uh, but these two terms that we're proposing, that we're using to arrive at this contradiction, uh, they, they should be, uh, or you know, it would be reasonable to expect that uh, they would be of the same uh, even odd parity, so they would both be even or both be odd. Uh, so there would be a 2 in the numerator which would balance it out. Um, and so uh, in particular there is a division by 2 that happens for both of these, right? So both of these terms uh, would have that same irrational balance uh, where the numerator would cancel out the denominator. So we haven't arrived at the conclusion that we were striving for. Um, so uh, that argument breaks down. And then uh, the argument for the squares, uh, I'm trying to remember what argument I eventually arrived at. Oh, um, this, uh, it, it's not clear that this is even a, a valid argument uh, because the while the relationship holds and the terms all look the same, uh, we've constructed an entirely new equation to do this. So it's it's not clear that we're even discussing the same terms. Uh, so uh, I, I apologize. I'm already at the three minute mark, um, but uh, you know we'll we'll just leave it to say that that both of those were uh, incorrect arguments, and so uh, we'll move on from that. But uh, I do want to mention. Um, a concept that is uh, that exists, uh, and so uh, whenever whenever we take Euclidean norms, uh, we always do the same thing. So we say that the distance between two points, you know, whatever, uh, x and y, is uh, the square root. of uh, x1 of, of the first coordinate, so x1 minus y1 squared plus x2 minus y2 squared. And, and so, uh, you know, if, if we draw it, so if uh, we're measuring the distance from here to here, So we want to know what the length of this vector is. And we know how to do it if we start at the origin. But this formula allows us to determine how long it is or, or what it, you know, what this thing is, uh, but you know, out in free space. But it's interesting that we always use squares. And one of the things I, I at least I wondered, and, and I imagine other people have as well, is why we still use square roots whenever we start dealing with uh, R3, whenever we start dealing with x, y, and z coordinates. Uh, so once you add that third term, why is it still a square root? Why is it not a cube root? Um, 
And the answer is essentially because while they're still planar with each other, right, so you haven't really changed anything, uh, you know, <laughs> everything is still eventually a straight line until you get to non-Euclidean spaces, which we're not really going to discuss. But that concept The, the concept of instead of taking square roots, taking cube roots, right? Uh, so, so we're taking cubes on the inside and then a cube root to kind of get the proper uh, mean, <laughs> the, the proper distance or whatever, uh, that exists. And so uh, the, the idea that we can do that exists and it's perfectly valid. Uh, and this family of uh, roots or whatever, uh, in coordination with the power that you take whenever you're taking the difference of coordinates, uh, this is called uh, uh, LP metrics. A cursive L with the P subscript um, and it's just defined you know, where we have this distance function D uh, and we're adding together uh, we take we add or we take the difference coordinate by coordinate. So the x coordinate of the first point minus the x coordinate of the second point, the y coordinate of the first point minus the y coordinate of the second point, the z coordinate of the third point minus or of the first point minus the z coordinate of the second point, and so on and so forth. And and so you can take this in uh, in any arbitrary space, any arbitrary number of dimensions, but you know, we tend to think in one, two, or three dimensions. Um, and so then the P, this P corresponds to the power that you put here. So it's not a given that you would take a square inside of here. Uh, and then uh, this one over P kind of normalizes it all. But if we have all of this equal one, right? So if we consider just the points where they're um, so if we have an origin here, and then we look at all the points x that are, you know, some distance one from the origin, then, well, we can get rid of this one over p by raising both sides to the p. And so, right, uh, because one to the p is still one. Right? Uh, and then we can get rid of the y because we're measuring from the origin. Uh, so now we have this series of points which are distance 1 in the LP space uh, from the origin. So it's not necessarily that uh, Pythagorean theorem distance, right, where we're, we're taking the hypotenuse of some coordinates. Uh, we're taking something a little funkier, right? But um, this this concept, right, uh, is exactly the same so our general formula, right? But if we replace the n with p, Uh, and then if we divided both sides by c to the p, so we get uh, okay. So then now we have two coordinates. Right? So an x and a y. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so we've made those substitutions, so we have something familiar. So whenever p is 2, this is the unit circle, right? x squared plus y squared equals 1. Uh, and then whenever it's larger than 2, it's uh, something a, a little weirder. So it's, it's not quite a square. So the inner one is supposed to be a circle and the outer one is supposed to be, I don't know, I don't know what to call it, but it's a, a unit disk in the LP space where P is larger than two and less than infinity, right? And so it tends towards this box and then at the limit it is the, uh, the unit box or whatever, but it's a, a radius one, not, not side length one. Okay. Um, anyway, so the, the theorem that we have now twice failed to show, or by we I mean me, uh, that I have now twice failed to show, uh, is essentially saying that, well, we can have rational points on this inner one whenever it's a perfect circle. But once you start dealing with this out, outer weird thing, um, you can have one rational point, but you can't have two, and that's, that's exactly what Fermat is uh, demonstrating. Right? But uh, it's a little harder, or it's, it's significantly harder uh, then deriving those rational points for the unit circle, uh, which is why you know it sat open for over 350 years. Um, but intuitively, that is another way of looking at the problem that we're we're trying to demonstrate is to show that uh, you know if uh, that whatever trick you use, you won't be able to find any pair of x y coordinates where both x and y are rational on this uh, weirder unit disk, right? the one that doesn't quite look like a circle. It uh, looks like a, a circle that has had a very uh, a full Thanksgiving meal. Right. Uh, okay, anyway, uh, so I'm, uh, I've, I've taken way too much time on, on this particular problem. Okay, so uh, I will, you will have noticed that I, I did update the notes, so it didn't make any sense that we had an integer divided by a probability here. So I'm, I'm glad we stopped there last time. Um, so returning to our definition of probabilities and uh, a few theorems, right? So here we had pairwise disjoint events, and we said uh, the probability of uh, the union of these events. So if we say uh, either, uh, you know, the probability that anyone in our family won the lottery is the probability that Bill won the lottery or Sue won the lottery and so on and so forth, naming uh, everyone in our fictional family. Uh, and that's exactly equal to the sum of the individual bill, uh, individual probabilities. So uh, none of them had the same lottery number, so they were all disjoint events. And then, you know, every one of them had some number of lottery tickets. So individually, they each had their own probabilities. Uh, and the probability that any one of them won, the union of those events, uh, is the same as the uh, their individual probabilities that they won. Okay, uh, so now uh, conditional probability. Uh, the probability that E happens given F. So, uh, you know, E, um, let's see. Uh, if the sun is shining, then there's a 5% chance that the birds are in the air. But uh, on any given, or, well, say uh, there's a 70% chance that birds are in the air. Uh, but on any given day, there's only 50% chance that there are birds in the sky during daytime. Right? Uh, well, uh, if we know that the sun is shining, then and we've counted up all of the events, whatever, and we look at the probability of the intersections, uh, that both the sun is shining and that there's birds in the air, then we can compute this from that separate knowledge, uh, the probability of E intersect F divided by the probability of F. Uh, and then uh, likewise, you can move the F, the probability of F over here if you didn't know it, and we knew the probability of the intersection, and you divided it by the probability of E given F, uh, let's say you were only able to sample the skies on sunny days, then 
you could derive the probability of f from that separate knowledge. Right? Uh, okay, uh, so then uh, the events E and F are independent if and only if uh, the probability of their intersection uh, is exactly equal to the probability of E times the probability of F. Uh, and so uh, this is uh, another way of, uh, or you know, we haven't really discussed this yet, but there's this relationship between uh, addition and unions and or operators uh, and the complement to that is the relationship between multiplication and intersections and and operators. So, you know, you can learn to read them uh, kind of uh, interchangeably. So the probability of E and F, or the probability of E intersect F, uh, is equal to the probability of E times the probability of F. Uh, so, um, okay, so think on that, right? but that's by definition, right? That's not a theorem. Uh, okay, so then uh, the events uh, E1, E2, all the way to EN are pairwise independent if and only if uh, every time we consider a pair of events, if their probabilities, uh, if the product of their probability is equal to the product or the probability of their intersection. Right. And again, this is by definition, this isn't a theorem okay. uh, for all pairs i and j. Uh, the events are mutually independent. So another way of writing it is that they're mutually independent. So there is absolutely no overlap in any one of them uh, if the probability of all of their intersections is equal to the product of their individual probabilities. Okay. okay. Uh, so there's a special type of experiment called a Bernoulli trial, uh, and this is pass-fail, success or failure, heads or tails, true or false, win or lose, one or zero, uh, anything where it, it either happens or it did not happen, whatever it is, uh, is called a Bernoulli trial. Uh, and um, we, uh, in computer science, we use the term Boolean Right, so it's a, a Boolean event. It's either true or false. But uh, the broader term, especially in terms of statistics, is called uh, Bernoulli trial. Uh, and so these are always mutually independent because either it happened or it didn't happen. Right. Uh, so we ignore the case where you flip the coin and it lands on its side. <laughs> uh, it's uh, you know we'll just say that that never happens. Right. Uh, so it's always mutually independent. It's never both. It's never some hedge in between. It's always one or the other. Uh, okay, uh, so theorem. Uh, the probability of exactly k successes in, in Bernoulli, independent Bernoulli trials with probability of success p and probability of failure q equals 1 minus p uh, is equal to the combination of n choose k times probability of, uh, times p to the k times q to the n minus k. Uh, and so this is the binomial distribution. So if you haven't seen it before, uh, then uh, here, let me show you. Uh, so essentially, whenever you have uh, like uh, x plus y, uh, here, let me show you. Okay. Uh, so uh, whenever we study polynomials, we learn how to do the multiplication. Uh, and so we learned Pascal's triangle. That's one way to look at this. Uh, but there's a, a shorthand using the notation of combinatorics. Okay. So this is x squared plus 2xy plus y squared. This is 3x squared y, 3xy squared, y cubed. Uh, and then the general rule uh, for however many you have is so you have some x to the n that follows suit right and you can look at Pascal's triangle and see what this is uh, and then some y to the n uh, and then you know what happens in between um, well there's this sum uh, 
a equals one to minus one. Uh, where it's in choose k, right? So we're using combinatorics, uh, and then. x to the n minus k times y to the k. So that's how you find all of the, the messy stuff in between. So you don't have to actually multiply all this out if you don't want to. You can use this shorthand notation and save yourself a, a little bit of trouble um, with it without having to track all the terms. Like it's, this problem is, is well known. Uh, and so uh, this is the binomial distribution. So you start with this, it's x plus y uh, raised to some power, and then you get this other thing. Uh, so this, this right here, is uh, what we're looking at right here, right? So combination of n choose k, p to the k, q to the n minus k. So this was x, or I guess technically this would have been x, x to the n minus k, and this was y to the k. Okay. Um, so, uh, so Bernoulli's uh, trials, they follow... Uh, this binomial distribution because uh, there's only ever two possibilities it's x or y right uh, and so um, so we can compute the individual or, or the number of trials that we would expect in terms of like uniform distribution like if they're each equally likely to happen uh, then if we ran uh, like if we flipped a coin a hundred times then in would be 100 uh, and we want to know how many times it came up you know heads occurred exactly 37 times then it would follow this format right so n is 100 we're choosing 37 uh, heads up right uh, so then uh, 37 here uh, in 100 minus 37 here uh, each of these has a 50% likelihood or whatever so we can compute the probability of exactly that number of occurrences right? uh, and so this distribution is called the binomial distribution because this is exactly that same the same as that binomial form we were just looking at uh, and I just note it here that it looks familiar because it's the coefficients for the expansion of the binomial as we just discussed uh, okay uh, so then uh, a random variable you already you're probably already familiar with this, but a random variable is a function from the sample space of an experiment to the set of the real numbers. Uh, and so basically it's just a, a random number, right? <laughs> so it's a variable that we use as a placeholder to indicate that we expect to put in a random number. And we want to know, you know, what the likelihood is in general if we, you know, if we can't control this random number, right? Uh, and so then the first thing you do is you put bounds on it. So in case of heads and tails, you already know that it's one of two possibilities. So the random variable really only has two possible outcomes. Its range is just those two, either zero or one, heads or tails or whatever. Um, uh, and you know, you use context to see whether or not there's any other restrictions you can put. But essentially, it means that it's not uh, derived. You know that that is the feeder into whatever probability you're measuring. So it's some unknown, and then you're trying to understand, given that it's unknown. Uh, okay, so Bayes' theorem. Uh, suppose that E and F are events from the sample space S, such that the probability of E is not zero, and the probability of F is not zero. So you don't end up with any division by zero here. And also, like, it, uh, you know, it, it doesn't equal zero and zero on both sides of the equation, right? So assume that it's interesting. <laughs> then uh, the probability of F given E is equal to the probability of E given F times the probability of F divided by the probability of E. So uh, I uh, there's this channel on YouTube that I love uh, called uh, Three Blue, One Brown. Uh, and it's uh, it, it just has a, a lot of production effort that goes into it and explaining these concepts from math. I, I uh, watch videos from the channel all the time, uh, especially whenever I want a refresh or whatever. I, I think it's just a brilliant channel. Uh, and so one of the insights that they provided uh, on that channel was that uh, we could view Bayes' theorem as a way to update our understanding of probability 
on an ongoing basis. So we have these separate probabilities for E and F. Uh, and then something happened, something was measured. Uh, and we now know that the event E happened. So we want to know what's the likelihood of F happening, updating our understanding. So we knew what the probability of F was before anything happened, right? Uh, so uh, the probability of uh, you know some individual um, buying a house with a pool and then the probability of an individual buying a house with a pool once they've won the lottery right <laughs> so the the situation has updated a little bit and you move into different territory and so this is the theorem that allows us to transition from our previous state of knowledge to our updated state of knowledge right? uh, okay so it's uh, it's used uh, you know a, a lot in finance because uh, you're constantly trying to update your understanding of situations um, and I want to say economics as well uh, but it's um, it's an extremely important theorem that there's zero chance that I'm gonna be able to give it justice right now uh, but that is the spirit behind it right, is that we're using it to update our knowledge uh, and so you, whenever we see these conditional probabilities you know probability of F given E you, you can think of it in those terms right that that is why we're dealing with with all of these and and that's why it's interesting is that um, we don't have to you know measure everything again from the beginning uh, we had our original understanding and now we're just updating it so we have more accurate state of affairs uh, you know our probabilities are made relevant given the new information uh, and so this is an alternative representation. Uh, these two are equivalent, and you can use some of the definitions that we've already provided uh, to see that that is true. Um, okay, uh, and so it's you just choose based on what's more convenient, what information you have. Uh, but clearly, uh, <laughs> from the numerator matching, we know that this is just another way of representing the probability of E. Uh, you know. uh, okay. Uh, so the probability of E given F times the probability of F plus the probability of E given not F times the probability of not F, right? So the probability of E, whether or not F happened, right? Uh, okay, uh, so then the theorem, the next theorem, uh, suppose that E is an event from a sample space S, and then F1, F2, all the way up to Fn are mutually exclusive uh, events such that uh, they have a union which is equal to the set sample space S, right? So that S is all of these events. So these are the separate possibilities, right? So you can look at F as um, the the faces of a die. Right? Uh, so then assume that the probability of E, which is not equal to zero, and the probability of F sub I, so a particular event, uh, equals zero. Uh, for uh, where I is just one of the <laughs> one of the possibilities of uh, one of the possible events, uh, then this should be not equal to zero. I'm getting a little tired of my typos here, but I, I apologize. I, I will try to fix that. Uh, so the probability that both of these are non-zero, uh, then the probability of f sub j given e. Uh, is equal to the probability of E given J times the probability of F given J uh, all over the sum of these mutual probabilities, right? And so this is just a, an extension of Bayes' theorem, uh, but where we're looking at more and more uh, pairwise events. Uh, okay, so then uh, expected value versus variance. Uh, so we're all familiar with expected value that's just taking an average or a mean uh, on some random variable x. Uh, so when we're talking about coin flips, you flip it a hundred times. Uh, what is the average of all of those outcomes? Um, so you know there's one in uh, I don't even want to count uh, the number of probabilities. One in two to the one hundred, I think, <laughs> uh, possible. Uh, outcomes uh, uh, whenever you flip it a hundred times where everything comes up heads and 
1 out of 2 to the 100 where everything comes up tails uh, and um, and so you know everything <laughs> every possibility that you can have with heads also exists with tails and the mean the expected outcome ends up being um, half of the time it's heads and half of the time it's tails so that's what you're expecting uh, but uh, again, that's just an average. Uh, it's always a surprise whenever you land exactly on the mean. You just expect it to kind of hover around there most of the time. Uh, so the deviation of x at s in s, so some sample in our space, uh, of x of s minus e of x. Uh, right? So this is by definition. Uh, so uh, given See, the deviation of x given uh, for a given sample is the difference between the value of x and the mean of x. Uh, so how much did we miss from our expected value? So we flipped it 100 times, we got 55, so we missed our expected value by 5 coin flips. Um, and then uh, there is a way to take an average of that deviation. Right? So how much did you miss on average? Uh, let x be the number that comes up when a fair die is rolled. What is the expected value of x? Uh, so uh, it's it's right in the middle. So uh, we add up all of the possible outcomes, right? Uh, so the random variable x takes in, uh, but it, it's important to look at the examples so that you know, uh, so that you kind of demystify the terminology. Right? Uh, so uh, it takes on an integer value, 1 through 6. Uh, each of these values has a probability of 1 of 6 being the sign which faces up after the roll. Uh, and then we use the above formula to compute the value. So this, and then a sum. So the probability of the individual event, uh, and then uh, times that xi, whatever. So the numeric value of it. So we're assigning a numeric value, so this actually does have some value. Right? So first we replace the probabilities, 1 and 6, 1 and 6, 1 and 6, 1 and 6, 1 and 6. Uh, and then we replace the numeric value that we've assigned to each face of the die. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, and then using that formula, we can convert you know, uh, our, our intuition uh, into something that's very non-intuitive. Right? Uh, so uh, we get if we add all of those up, we get 21 over 6, and that reduces to 7 over 2. So the expected value is something that isn't even on the die. So three and a half, it's not a face on the die. So you will never get the expected value, but it is the average of all of the uh, possible outcomes on a fair die. Right. So. Uh, again, the expected value doesn't necessarily mean we expect to get it. We expect to get something in the neighborhood of it, right? So that if you take a, a long-term average, it will tend towards this expected value. Uh, so even though three and a half isn't on the die, if you roll it a billion times, uh, your average value, one through six, will come up pretty close to seven over two. Right? Okay, so then our next theorem uh, if x is a random variable and p of x uh, equals r is the probability of x uh, equal to r, uh, then the probability that x equals r is uh, given by the sum of the probabilities of s, where s is a sample, x is the random is the value of that random sample, right? Um, and we want it to equal r. Uh, so then we have the expected value is equal to the probability, the sum of the probabilities where x is r uh, times r itself, right? times that numeric value. Uh, okay. Uh, so then, uh, a, a lot of this will be covered if you go into a separate probability class, so I apologize if I'm running through it. Uh, we only refer back to a few of these, uh, but I do uh, like to cover the ground, uh, it, at least that um, you know, uh, uh, so that you've seen it. You you have to see and, and hear these things uh, like six or seven times before uh, they really set in your memory. So even if you plan on taking a probability class or you've taken one or whatever, uh, it's still beneficial to 
uh, to kind of go over it and see it and refresh your memory. Uh, and then eventually it'll start sticking. Uh, but the important thing is that you're you're introduced to it. So uh, so even if you don't uh, retain you know even 10% of what we go over, the fact that the idea has crossed your mind and that you've tread on it a little bit, uh, it'll uh, prime your brain to receive it later on. Uh, or so I tell myself, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, so the next theorem. Uh, the expected number of successes when uh, we run in mutually independent trials, Bernoulli trials, right, 50-50, coin flips, whatever, um, where P is the probability of success on each trial is N times P. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, so that makes sense. So if you have only two possible events, right, uh, and if it's 50-50, then you would expect the value to come up uh, as uh, the number of coin flips, right, so 100 or 1,000 or whatever, times the probability of each, which is uh, 0 0.5, right, or 1 half, uh, so that if you flipped it 1,000 times, you'd expect to get uh, 500 heads, right, that's the expected value. Uh, or um, uh, if there was a bias, so let's say uh, it's a 3 fourths chance that you get a one and a one in four chance that you get a zero, uh, then what this tells us is that the probability uh, for the one right, is three fourths. So in your numeric average, if you counted one as whenever it happened and zero whenever it didn't, uh, would be n times that probability. So if you ran that event, that biased event where three fourths of the time it comes up true or whatever, uh, then uh, you would expect to get uh, a thousand, right, your number of trials times that probability. So in that case, in the biased case, you would get 750 as your numeric value. Uh, okay. Uh, so in theorem, uh, uh, if xi, where i is one of our numbered events, right, i is our serial number, uh, our random variables on s and if I, A and B are real numbers, uh, then the expected value of these events individually, or uh, of the combination of these events, is equal to the expected value of the events individually. Um, okay, uh, so then, uh, and uh, the expected value of A times X plus B is equal to a times the expected value of x plus b. Uh, okay, so consider these as um, separate sample spaces. So we have, um, we measured the distribution or, or the probability of getting, uh, you know, of rolling a die to see whether or not it was fair. Uh, and we did it, you know, on day one and then on day two and then on day three and day four or whatever. Uh, and we tried to run it a hundred times, but we didn't get it a hundred times each time. Uh, but we can combine those results, right? It's reasonable to combine those results into a single expected value. So it's, it's the same as if we ran the experiment one time using each of these samples individually, right? Uh, and that is the same as if we measured them separately. So if we separated out our measurements from day one, day two, all the way to day n. It's exactly the same as if we treated it as a single experiment. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so doing your science experiment on the last day is the same as if you had done it uh, all throughout your month or however long you have, right? Uh, okay, and then uh, the expected value uh, of a times x plus b Right, so if you perform some linear transformation on it, uh, it's just the same as if you uh, didn't transform it, but you measured here, E of X, uh, and then you transformed that. Right, so it has this linearity property. Uh, okay, so then uh, a random variable X has a geometric distribution with parameter P if, uh, if it obeys this law, P of X equals K, is equal to 1 minus p uh, to the k minus 1 times p. Right. Um, 
So uh, essentially, this is uh, the complement, 1 minus p is the likelihood that this event did not happen. Uh, and so p is the parameter we're measuring. And so it has a geometric distribution if uh, for this property. Uh, if it occurs once and then uh, the probability is equal to the probability of it not occurring uh, k minus one times and then it occurred one once one time. Okay. Uh, so this is by definition. So uh, if you see a reference to some geometric distribution with a parameter p, then they want you to refer back to this definition. Right? But this isn't a theorem. Again, we're learning terminology here. Uh, okay, uh, p is some real number. k is whatever we choose, but it's an integer. Right? Uh, okay, so now we have a theorem. So given some geometric distribution, so a thing that obeys this law with respect to some event p or some parameter p. So uh, if the random variable has that geometric distribution with parameter p, then the expected value of x is equal to 1 over p. OK. Uh, and then uh, the random variables x and y on a sample space are independent if the probability of x and the probability of y is equal to the probability of x times the probability of y. Uh, so before we were calling these uh, mutually exclusive or uh, you know the disjoint likelihoods or whatever, so this is just another term for the exact same concept. So now we're saying that it's independent right? uh, if it follows this property, and that is by definition. Right? Uh, okay. Uh, Okay, uh, and then this is just linking it back to uh, how we can think about these sample spaces and so forth. Uh, okay, so now we have another theorem. Uh, so if x and y are independent random variables on a sample space, then uh, the expected value of x times y is equal to the expected value of x times the expected value of y. Uh, and so uh, a lot of these, like it, it doesn't appear to be saying a whole lot, but it's uh, these are the tools that allow you to cleanly separate properties so that you can measure things separately or uh, so that you can move in the other direction. That if you had this, then you can simplify it to this form. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, it, it tends not to stick until you start doing work that actually requires it. Uh, and so my apologies that I, I haven't really built up a good problem set to kind of drill in these things um, but uh, you know hopefully if you end up taking a probability and statistics course then uh, you'll get that work in to help you familiarize yourself with these uh, okay uh, so now we discuss variance and so this is a, another type of deviation uh, so then we have some random variable in a sample space s and we say that the variance of x uh, which we'll call v of x, uh, is given by measuring the sum of, uh, <laughs> of our errors, right? So we have this expected value. Uh, so we say we flip a coin 100 times, we expect it to happen heads 50 times, but we measured 60. So then we missed our expected value by 10. Uh, and then now we're going to compute this thing called variance. And so uh, because you know missing it, having 10 too many is the same as 10 too few uh, we take the square of it so that gets rid of the negative sign and says okay well you know undershooting is the same as overshooting uh, whenever we're measuring this uh, and so really we just want to know uh, kind of the area around our expected value right because the expected value just gives you a neighborhood like whenever we measure the expected value of rolling the die, we expect to get a value of three and a half, which isn't on the die, right? So the expected value is really only good for giving you a neighborhood, right? And then we want to know how that neighborhood fills in. So how much stuff is close to the neighborhood, the expected value, and how much stuff is really far away. Um, and so, um, and so variance and standard deviation are the two ways that we measure that. So then, uh, so we take that square 
of the air, of the measured air, something that you probably would have seen if you did linear regression. Uh, and then we multiply it times the probability of S um, for each sample in our space. Right? So we took 100 measurements, or we ran the trials, the set of trials, 100 times. Uh, and then each one of them came back with uh, some error, right? So we ran the trials 100 times, and each one of them involved 10 coin tosses. So we expected five, uh, five heads out of those 10 coin tosses from each trial. Uh, and so then we treat them like now we run those sets, right? Each set of 10 through here, we measure the individual error, and we square it, and then we multiply it times the probability of you know whatever individual uh, sample we're measuring, right? Uh, and then that sum is the variance. Uh, okay. Well, uh, we haven't <laughs> like this can get quite large, right? Uh, so. Uh, in order to clean that up a little bit so we don't have this enormous number, uh, it's more common to discuss the standard deviation, which is the square root uh, of each of these. And I'm actually, I feel pretty confident that we should be dividing by the number of samples here as well. Uh, so the number of series that we took, not the number of samples. So if we ran the trial 100 times, there should be division by n. So that variance is like an average, right? And then standard deviation is where we get rid of the square in case we're dealing with large numbers. So we don't end up with some, some <laughs> absurdly large thing, right? But whenever you're dealing with small numbers where the error is like 10 to the minus six or something like that, uh, then it makes more sense to discuss variance because standard deviation will drive that, like taking the square root, it'll pull it back towards one. Uh, which isn't representative of what's going on. Right? Uh, so if it's really small, it makes sense to use variance, uh, but the correct definition of variance, not this garbage that I put up here for you, my apologies. Uh, here's the page number, <laughs> so you should verify that. Uh, and then uh, standard deviation, to clean that up. Uh, okay, so think of these, of both of these, uh, as measuring like the wildness of the samples. Uh, so for example, a uh, talented dart thrower or an untalented dart thrower uh, will create a result set on the XY coordinates. Um, and uh, so even if they're terrible at darts, the expected value is going to be a bullseye uh, because their distribution, you know, if they throw it a thousand times, uh, even if they never hit the dart board proper <laughs> and they're only getting around it, uh, it's going to average out to a bullseye. Uh, but uh, we learn that they are they truly are a terrible dart thrower, not by taking that expected value, but by measuring the variance, uh, or you know, standard deviation, as it were. Um, and it shows just like <laughs> how often they miss each time they throw, like how much they miss by. Uh, and so in that case, that's where the story is told, not in the expected value. Uh, okay. So then, uh, now we have this theorem. Uh, and so if x is a random variable on a sample space, then the variance of s uh, is equal to the expected value of x squared minus uh, the expected value of x, and then all of that squared. Okay, uh, so that was a theorem, another theorem or corollary to that theorem. Uh, if we have a random variable x, sample space s, then the expected value of x is equal to m, that's our, our mean, um, then the variance of x is equal to e, uh, the expected value of x minus that mean squared. Right? Uh, and so this is something that you'll see uh, in, uh, in the exponent of um, a Gaussian distribution or a bell curve. Um, and so just expect to see this x minus mu squared where m is the, or mu is the, the mean. Again, whenever you do uh, distributions on continuous random variables. Okay, uh, another theorem. Uh, so we have x and y, which are two independent random variables on a sample space s. Then the variance of x plus y is equal to the variance of x plus the variance of y, each of those individually, right? 
Uh, and you'll you'll notice that we're always or it seems pretty often that we're able to separate these things whenever they're independent whenever whatever happens with x doesn't really affect what happens with y like they're completely independent events then we uh, we tend to have this property where we can separate them uh, or where we can put them together without worrying about some missing adjustment uh, okay uh, and that is tends to be true in set theory as well like we're there is no correction if there's no intersection. Right? So uh, you should see this overlap uh, in set theory as well. Uh, okay. So then furthermore, uh, we also have the, uh, some variable xi or some measurement of a random variable xi uh, where <laughs> it's one of the many, the n trials that we ran or the n samples that we measured. Um, or, yeah, uh, sets of experiments, however you want to term it, right? Uh, or pairwise independent uh, random variables on our sample space S. Uh, then, uh, if they're independent, right, and even if we have more than just the two, so long as each of them is individually independent, then we can separate them out into these separate variances. Okay. Uh, and then, what appears to be the last theorem for probability. Uh, is uh, we have some random variable x in a sample space s with a probability function p uh, and then r is uh, some real positive number uh, which acts as the lower bound on the air right? uh, so when we say that uh, the probability that uh, the absolute uh, what is it? This is the absolute value of x of s minus uh, e of x, right? So uh, the error, the probability of an outlier, right? So r is some lower bound on it, and we say the probability that uh, you are uh, more than 20 points off of the class average in your test, right? Uh, so r is some uh, event that we're measuring. So the probability that you're outside of what we consider to be normal, plus or minus 20 points from the class average, uh, is equal or is uh, bounded above by the variance of x, right? the variance, the wildness of that sample space uh, or that random variable that's measured, uh, divided by r squared. So this is a theorem. This isn't by definition. Uh, so you'd have to <laughs> do a fair amount of work to prove this, um, but essentially this is a way of saying that uh, our the probability of getting an outlier is bounded above in some sense by the variance uh, divided by the square of how far you're measuring out right so uh, you know even with a, a wide test score distribution the probability of getting a test score that's more than a hundred points off the class average uh, is is going to be exceedingly low. <laughs> it's going to be driven down to almost nothing by this, right? Um, so uh, the larger you pick R, the lower that uh, uh, probability is, uh, and it's because it's bounded by this, right? Uh, okay. Uh, all right. So now on to uh, what your next homework, uh, what homework two. Uh, discusses. So advanced counting techniques, uh, applications of recurrence relations, and we're going to start solving them. So those homeworks ask you to solve those problems. Uh, I think some of you may have already been able to tackle them, but uh, now we're going to discuss where those functions come from like and ways to, to resolve them. Uh, the ones that we were trying to prove inductively, and now we're going to generate them ourselves. Uh, okay, so by definition, an algorithm follows the dynamic programming paradigm uh, when it recursively breaks down a problem into simpler overlapping subproblems and computes the solutions using solutions of the subproblems. So uh, last semester I didn't really do a whole lot on dynamic programming, uh, but um, you know we'll see uh, how the semester goes. Um, but uh, you know now we have these recurrence relations and yes we're going to solve them but part of it is we want to know like uh, whenever we 
try and solve a problem recursively, like using a recursive function as we did for uh, merge sort or binary search, uh, where we're calling the same function over and over again, and it's doing some amount of work. Uh, it's uh, uh, <laughs> you have to you have to understand the work from this chapter uh, in order to understand how that behaves long term. So, as your array, you know the the size of the array that you're sorting or uh, whatever problem it is that you're tackling, uh, as that gets larger, as it goes from a thousand to a million, and from a million to a billion, uh, how is your algorithm going to perform? Uh, so we're developing the techniques in order to count that, in order to give you an answer of, of uh, <laughs> how bad our code is. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so that's really the spirit behind it, right? and so this is just saying dynamic programming, you know, it. it recursively breaks it down, yada, yada, yada. Um, but we're, we're going to build the techniques and we're going to build up to the master theorem, which tells us essentially um, the, the runtime for our recursive algorithms. But uh, we have a little bit of work to do before we get there. Right? Uh, so solving linear recurrence relations. So a linear homogeneous recurrence relation of degree k with constant coefficients. Uh, that's a mouthful, but that is the single term that we are defining. Right? Uh, is a recurrence relation of this form, right? So there's no powers of two or powers of three or whatever. There's no nothing in the exponent. Uh, each term is uh, some constant multiple of previous terms added together, right? So that's the, the linear <laughs> homogeneous. There's nothing being added, so we're going to have non-homogeneous in a little bit. Uh, it's still a recurrence relation, right, of degree k, so we're reaching back k terms, uh, and then constant coefficients, so these are not variable. Right? Uh, okay, so by definition, <laughs> this is is this thing, right, so this thing that you've already been working with. Uh, and so these are constants in R, uh, and the last one is not equal to zero, and again, uh, this is just terrible, this is the worst. Okay. Uh, so then, uh, for example, we have the Fibonacci sequence, right? So f is equal to f sub n minus 1 plus f sub n minus 2. So we're adding together the, pre the two previous terms to get uh, f sub n, right? <laughs> Should be a sub n there. Uh, and uh, linear homogeneous of degree 2. So uh, it's linear, there's no powers. The constant coefficients, they're both 1, so you don't think about it a lot, but the 1 is hidden there. Uh, we're multiplying by one, uh, and it's degree two because we're reaching back two terms. So another uh, is the relation a sub n equals a sub n minus five. We're reaching back five terms. That's linear homogeneous of degree five. Okay. Uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, so we have another definition here. Polynomials reveal themselves in many places. Uh, they can be used in infinite series to approximate any continuous function. Uh, so we have linear approximation and series expansions from calculus and so forth. Uh, they can also be used in solving linear homogeneous differential equations as well as linear homogeneous recurrence relations. And so there seems to be this uh, this link between uh, linear uh, homogeneous differential equations and linear homogeneous recurrence relations. Like we end up using the similar strategies to approach both of them. Um, <laughs> and then they both end up having these exponential solutions as well. So they're, you know, I, I think there is something there linking them, but uh, I, I guess I, I haven't really done uh, enough work to kind of leg that down and understand uh, really what it is uh, or who initially found that link. Uh, anyway, the underlying relationship is a bit of a mystery, uh, but sometimes mathematicians, <laughs> yeah, uh, so this is my speculation, right? I don't know this for a fact, but. Uh, you know, sometimes it, it just, you know, you do a thing and it works, and so you try it again somewhere else and uh, see whether or not it works. Um, and so uh, that is an approach that, that you can take, just, you know, trial and error in these, uh, you know, you, you have some hypothesis and then you see whether or not uh, it holds up uh, once you start doing the analysis for it. Uh, and so my understanding, uh, as it is, my limited understanding, uh, is that that's the case here, right? So. Uh, it, you know, there there was a spirit that everything was polynomials. Everything could be explained by polynomials, uh, and so they had these relationships. And their first thought was to convert it to a polynomial series. Right? Uh, 
Uh, so here we replace uh, a sub n, so the nth term in the sequence, with r to the n. Right? So here, 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 here. And you leave the constant coefficients the same. Right? Uh, and then, well, this would give us a separate polynomial for every term in the series. Uh, and that's, uh, that's dirty. We don't want to work with that. Uh, so one way to clean it up uh, is first to move all of this to the left-hand side. So we subtract both sides by this. And so now on the left-hand side, we have r to the n minus this sum, right? And because we're negating the whole thing, we end up with minus uh, the n minus 1 term, minus the n minus 2 term, and so forth, to the n minus k. Uh, okay, but again, we still have this problem where each term in our sequence now has its own polynomial. But we want a single polynomial to represent the whole thing. So we can get that by dividing dividing out by the smallest term, right? So that this goes to 1, right? And we're just left with ck here. Uh, and then this uh, goes to k, so uh, minus n minus k. So the n's cancel out and we get k, right? Uh, so by dividing the whole thing by this, right, where r is not equal to zero, uh, we now have this. And so this is called the characteristic polynomial. So we, it took us a couple steps to get there. First, we started thinking this is a polynomial instead of uh, terms in a sequence. Um, then we moved it all to one side so that it looked like a polynomial. Uh, and then uh, we made it constant for the entire sequence. Uh, so we got rid of this n term. Uh, and replaced it with just the first k terms. And we say, okay, well, those first k powers, or you know, uh, the polynomial of degree k, describes the entire sequence. We can describe the whole thing using this one characteristic polynomial. Uh, okay, uh, and so uh, the sequence a sub n, these terms, uh, where a sub n equals r to the n, and r is not equal to zero is a solution if and only if r is a solution to the characteristic polynomial. Uh, and so now we say that we have this, we can develop this function uh, from this characteristic polynomial by finding the roots to this polynomial, right? So the points, uh, the values of r where this thing is equal to zero. Uh, and so the solutions of this equation are called the characteristic roots of the recurrence relation. So now we have a theorem. So all of that, I believe, was by definition, right? Yeah. So that was the definition, right? <laughs> so distinguishing definitions from theorems. So now we have a theorem. Uh, so uh, we have these two constants, and they're real numbers. Uh, and this one is not equal to 0. Right? Uh, then uh, r squared minus c1r minus c2 uh, equals 0 has two distinct roots, r1 and r2. Uh, the sequence a sub n is a solution to the recurrence relation uh, to this recurrence relation, which is familiar, if and only if uh, a sub n is equal to this. And this is the function that we're trying to generate. So we were given those functions with exponentials earlier and asked to prove by induction whether or not it solves the recurrence relation. And so now we're saying, okay, well, we have this characteristic polynomial that we can derive by converting this into a polynomial uh, and then uh, make converting it into a characteristic polynomial by dividing out the r to the n minus 2, right, and so forth. Right? Uh, and then we solve for the roots uh, of that polynomial, so something of this flavor. We find out when that's equal to 0, uh, and we know well, the fundamental theorem of algebra that there's two of them, right? Uh, and so then we say we can convert those roots, r1 and r2, uh, into if they're distinct roots, we can convert them into something like this. Uh, and we see that uh, really things of this nature, these linear homogeneous recurrence relations, constant coefficients, uh, they are exponential functions. Right? So they have this in, uh, in the exponent. And so they grow really, really fast whenever you start graphing them. Uh, you know, f of x equals something times x, right? It's it's really like 2 to the x or you know 10 to the x or whatever. And so uh, it's really, really fast growth. Uh, but we don't really think about it uh, whenever we're doing recurrence relations, or at least I didn't when I was first studying these. Uh, OK, uh, and so this function is going to have these constant terms here. Okay. Uh, and then we'll learn how to deal with them if they're repeated roots in a little bit. Uh, OK, 
So now we have an example. Uh, we start with the Fibonacci numbers. Uh, Fn equals Fn minus 1 plus Fn minus 2. So we're adding together two previous terms. F0 is 0, F1 is 1. Uh, and so first we identify the characteristic polynomial. right? Uh, and then we find out when that is 0. And so we can use the quadratic equation or, uh, for solving that. Uh, and so we have this first root and the second root, so it's 1 plus or minus square root of 5 over 2. So we say, okay, well now we have these roots, and we know that the solution is something like this, where these are the roots. So now we substitute that in, uh, and then we solve to figure out what these constants are by using the initial conditions, right? So when n is 0, we know that this sums to 0. So then n 0, n 0, right? Uh, and so we have a1 times 1 plus a2 times 1 uh, is equal to 0. So we know that a1 is the negation, or alpha1 is the negation of alpha2. Uh, and then we use the second one to create a, a system of equations that allows us to pull and solve it. So alpha1 times this to the first power plus alpha2 times this to the second power. Um, tells us uh, that uh, it gives us a, a value for both of those. So those add up to 1. We know that they're negations of each other. Uh, and so then we're able to compute that alpha 1 is equal to 1 over the square root of 5, and alpha 2 is negative 1 over the square root of 5. Uh, so now we plug in those values for alpha 1 and alpha 2 to what the previous theorem told us. Uh, and so we knew that it was alpha 1 times the first root to the n plus alpha 2 times the second root to the n according to that previous theorem. Well, we already had the roots, and now we have the constant coefficients. And so this is our closed form solution. Uh, and so we can do some manipulations to get rid of the square root of 5, but uh, we're not going to do them right now because uh, I, I haven't already typed them up. <laughs> uh, but uh, you, know, you can use like binomial theorem and expansions or whatever to kind of see that this really should always be an integer because it was defined from a recurrence relation that was defined for only integers and it had integer coefficients and and in no way should the square root of 5 necessarily be involved there uh, but it comes about because of the uh, quadratic uh, equation the quadratic formula that we used to solve for the roots um, but if if you so desired you could get rid of it and make it more apparent that it should always be an integer uh, okay so now we have the theorem uh, where we have constant c1 and c2, where the second one is not equal to zero, right? And so uh, suppose that this is our characteristic equation, uh, and it only has one root, which is repeated. Uh, so then we have that uh, solution to the recurrence relation of this form uh, has, uh, it, it must obey this uh, closed form solution. So before we had alpha 1 times the root, first root to the n, and alpha 2 times the second root to the n. But now because the roots are repeated, well, these would collapse into a single term, but it's uh, the, the laws of solving these recurrence relations doesn't allow that to collapse. Uh, and so the way to correct it, or the correct way to adjust for repeated roots, uh, you have the, you know, alpha, that first constant uh, times the root to the nth power, uh, and then uh, the second uh, summand is uh, alpha 2 times n times r0 to the n. Right? Uh, and then n is some natural number, right? That's our, our integer input into the function, uh, and alpha 1 and alpha 2 are constants. Uh, okay, so now we've solved for uh, recurrence relations uh, of degree 2 with distinct roots and then with repeated roots. And so now we have this theorem uh, where we have uh, some uh, degree k polynomial, right? Uh, so it doesn't have to be degree 2. We can solve for it in general. And, and it has k distinct roots. So all of it, it's a polynomial to the kth power. Right? Uh, and so fundamental theorem of algebra tells us that there's going to be k roots. And we're saying if they're all distinct, Okay, then the solution to that recurrence relation, uh, well, a recurrence relation that looks like this, will have this form, right? Uh, so 
uh, some constant times the first root to the nth power plus another constant times the second root to the nth power and so forth times a k constant or plus a k con a k constant times uh, our kth root to the nth power uh, where n is a number and the alphas are all constants uh, okay uh, so now we have uh, uh, yet another theorem that says okay well it's easy to solve the case where it's distinct right uh, but now if we have multiplicity so if we have repeated roots some of them are repeated and some of them aren't or whatever then it takes on this general form uh, okay well <laughs> this is uh, quite a bit to take in right so essentially you have the recurrence relation as we've been discussing you know something times first previous term, something else times the second previous term, and something else times some kth repeated term, or uh, some kth previous term. Okay. Uh, and so, as before, you can create a characteristic polynomial. Right? You can find all of the roots. Some of them repeat, and some don't. So, you know, you, you can look at that longer theorem, if you want, or that longer form, uh, but I think it's... Uh, I think it's easier just to look at what we did whenever we had that first repeated root. So each time you repeat a root, in order to continue to hold form whenever you're generating the uh, the function which solves it, the closed form solution, uh, the first time that a root appears, so whenever it's still distinct, uh, it has this form. Uh, and then each time it repeats, you add in a factor of n. So if it's repeated, so if it has a multiplicity of two, uh, then it's distinct and then it's repeated once. If it has a multiplicity of three, then it's distinct, it's repeated, and then it's repeated again. So then that root would have an alpha three n squared r zero to the n, right? And if it's repeated again, that next term would be alpha four n cubed r zero to the n and so forth. Uh, and so what this, all of this is saying is that the form holds. So these are the distinct roots. If they're all distinct, then you're only ever dealing with this, right? But each time you have a multiplicity, then you add in, in, and so forth. Uh, and then, uh, so it, it goes from zero up to m minus one, where this is your multiplicity, right? Uh, but it, it holds in general where, okay, well now you have another root, and so it was distinct, and then it was repeated, and then it was repeated again, and so forth, right? And so this is just a, a really long way of saying that. Uh, but uh, it, the trend that we established whenever we had a multiplicity for a degree two uh, recurrence relation, it holds in general regardless of how many you have. But yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about it because polynomials of degree larger than four uh, don't have some general solution anyway. So you're not going to be asked to solve these impossible problems. You'll only ever be given, you know, two, maybe a degree three uh, problem. But you know, I, I wouldn't worry too much about it. But we're just saying you know, we have this theorem that says, okay, well that rule holds in general. So uh, okay, just a couple more definitions and theorems, and then call it a day. Uh, okay, so a linear non-homogeneous recurrence relation with constant coefficients, so up until now, now it's been homogeneous, uh, is a recurrence relation like before, but now we have this non-homogeneous term in the sum. Right? Uh, and so this is just some function which depends on n, and it's not identically zero, otherwise it would be homogeneous. Right? So then within that we have this part this part, which is the associated homogeneous recurrence relation. So the solution to this, with this uh, monkey wrench thrown in, uh, is going to be built up from the solution where this wasn't thrown in, where we didn't have the monkey wrench. Right? And that, that part's called the associated homogeneous recurrence relation. Okay, uh, so now uh, we have uh, this sequence, right? And we say uh, that this, uh, not sure about the notation there, but 
is a particular solution of the homogeneous linear occurrence relation with constant coefficients this right uh, so there's the homogeneous part uh, and then the particular solution right uh, so this is the associated homogeneous recurrence relation and that gives us our homogeneous solution uh, and then the particular solution gets tacked on to it right so how do we find such a particular solution okay so uh, we have this right and um, and then the function right the functions that we'll be looking at and the ones that are uh, that have been solved are functions uh, of this form. So it's a polynomial which depends on n, right? This same n gets fed into this function. Uh, and so then that becomes the base uh, for some you know, power series. Uh, and then there's also this potential that uh, s is some constant raised to this, right? So it's a polynomial times uh, an exponential. Uh, and it may be a combination. It may be that this is one, and all of this, you know, is uh, and, and the entire uh, particular part, Moncurrent part, uh, is just the exponential. It may be that s is one, so that this part gets ignored, and it's just a polynomial and so forth. Um, so, but in general, it has this form, and it's flexible enough to to be either or or both. Uh, so then when s is not a characteristic root of the equation, so this s right here, the exponential part, if that appears, uh, of the associated linear homogeneous recurrence relation, uh, then, so we're still solving roots, right? Like this part right here, we still need to do that. We still need the homogeneous solution. Uh, but now we're doing a little bit extra to solve in case you have something of this form. Okay? So if this, and the function is given to you, right, is not one of those roots once you've solved the homogeneous part, uh, then uh, the particular solution that gets generated uh, has this form. Right? But if it is, then remember how we were attacking on for multiplicity, so if it repeated twice, if it had a multiplicity of twice, that is, uh, then it was um, alpha 1 times r to the n plus alpha 1 or alpha 2 times n times r to the n uh, and so then this acts this kind of acts like a an additional multiplicity right so now you're correcting this particular solution by tagging on n to the m uh, power where this was the multiplicity of the root as it appeared in the homogeneous uh, characteristic polynomial. Uh, okay, so that's a lot. We'll start with the example next time. Uh, again, you have a, another week uh, on that homework assignment, um, but uh, get started. Let me know if you have any questions. Uh, okay, uh, well, have a good evening.